And hello, my fabulous students. This is your favorite teacher, Mr. Jacobson. I am excited to be with you today. Today, we are going to talk about the transatlantic trade and all the different um, ideas of economy and commerce that were going about and were being put in practice throughout uh, North America and the colonies and also the effects. So let us begin. All right, so triangular trade. Uh, most people know it with Europe, Africa, and then the Americas, right? Um, this became a really popular trade network for uh, 1600s, 1700s, even 1800s to a degree. Um, this is typically how a voyage would go. Uh, ships would leave New England for West Africa, carry rum to be traded for African slaves. Ships uh, would set across the Atlantic in horrendous conditions called the Middle Passage. That's when they just sort of stocked as many African slaves as they could in that ship, knowing that, uh, you know, 30% or so would probably die. Uh, with those kind of conditions, it was horrific, known as the Middle Passage. Um, the slaves that survived would be traded in the West Indies for sugarcane, typically, and then ships returned to New England, where the sugar would be turned into rum and the cycle would repeat. So just keep in mind that slaves, the, the two most popular places for which African slaves were traded was Brazil and the Caribbean region. And mainly because that was prime weather for sugarcane, which is the king of cash crop uh, in this time period. So uh, tobacco is important too. It has its place, but sugar trumps all. Uh, in the 1600s, the Royal African Company had a monopoly on English trade slaving. Um, and and so, it, you know, for a long time, you know, they, they got this this monopoly where they're the only ones that you get to buy from. So they get to set the prices. Uh, and it, it wasn't that necessarily they were being corrupt or anything. They could, they couldn't keep up with the demand uh, that, that, that these, um, these colonies and, and these areas in the Americas needed for slaves. And so it, that monopoly was sort of uh, disbanded and any uh, merchant who wished to uh, get into that kind of business was able to. So they kind of deregulate it in a way. So mercantilism was a really big economic um, um, practice that, this, that Spain and Portugal and eventually France will do. Uh, mercantilism has to do with using tariffs and monopolies to ensure purchases. Um, it's this attitude that when you're doing um, commerce and and and, um, and with with countries and determining your wealth, the uh, that was determined by how much a country exported rather than imported. So mercantilism got really popular when Spanish discovered the Americas. Um, mercantilism is popular for just you know taking gold and silver. I mean, you can see it over here in, in the um, in the political cartoon. This could also be a political cartoon, not just for mercantilism, but imperialism. But they would take precious metals. They would take raw materials. Uh, and then they would also, you know, create, like, laws that you could only buy this if you lived in this country or whatever. I mean, this is what mercantilism is. It's when government gets involved in the economy and sort of forces purchases and, and buying habits, which tends to piss people off a little bit. So uh, anyway, so raw materials were being taken from, from these colonies and the attitude that mercantilism uh, wanted colonies because those colonies' sole purpose at that point was to help the mother country or the parent country become uh, more rich and wealthy. So England is going to start jumping on board to mercantilism around 1651, and eventually they'll eventually go to, to uh, capitalism. But uh, mercantilism will be the place which is going to piss off a lot of colonists. 
So one of the, one of the acts being passed that are important to our trading economic um, webcast here today is the navigation acts. So trading to and from colonies could be carried out only by English or colonial built ships operated only by English or colonial crews. So navigation act said, hey, guess what? You only, you only get to, uh, you can only trade with Engl official English or colonial built ships and official English or colonial crews. So again, navigational acts are these mercantilist ideas, right? Where they're forcing buying habits and they're, ma they're making it unlawful to, to purchase anybody else. Uh, even if they're cheaper, even if it's more economically feasible for you and your family, you still have to buy from these merchants who know you have to buy from them, so they're probably raising the prices. All goods imported to the colonies except for perishables had to be passed through ports in England. And specific goods from the colonies could only be exported to England. This first included tobacco, but the list kept growing longer and longer until, you know, you, you have it where colonists feel like, they're being put into a corner and they're losing freedom. They're losing that autonomy, which is one of the main reasons why so many people left England to go to Americas uh, because they wanted that, that freedom. Okay, so what are the effects going on here? So uh, we have monopolies in tobacco that are being sold only to England. And that is a, a pretty significant um, business venture. So that's going to cause the English government to start protecting that with with uh, with armies and ships and navies from the French and Spanish who might be trying to pillage and and try to uh, attack these these trading ships as well. So colonists could not manufacture their own goods and had to buy them from England at high prices since Chesapeake tobacco had to be sold to England. They were, they were required to accept low prices for their tobacco. This led to hard times for Virginia and Maryland. So as you can see, because there's this forcing of you have to sell to England, then they're able to lower their prices of what they're going to pay for it because they can't go somewhere else and say, well, screw you, I'll go, some, I'll go sell to, to Spain or, or to Portugal or, or even to, you know, to um Holland or, or whatever like they couldn't do that because the laws so when the house of burgesses um raised the prices remember the house of burgesses is is uh kind of like the the senate if you will the assembly in virginia they decide okay this can't keep going on we're gonna have to raise prices and uh that that should have been able to help things out but right right then you have a lot of uh, merchants in in um, in Great Britain that say, "Well, fine, then we're going to sell our manufactured goods at a higher rate that you have to buy from us anyway." So it it didn't do anything to really off uh, you know off shoot the cost, right? Colonists uh, still had to buy from the British, and the British got to buy exclusively from the Americans their tobacco. And they that that put them in just more power. It just gave them the the, the driver's seat in, in all this uh, commerce, right? So with all this going on, you have some intermarrying happening between uh, Native Americans and uh, and colonists. Um, colonists continue to trade with the Native Americans on things like food and furs. Um, most Native Americans who, who intermarried with the colonists, they didn't live in the colonies. It kind of wasn't even, it wasn't very, um, I guess, accepted socially. So they'd live in the Indian community. One of the exceptions would be Pocahontas and John Rolfe, who both lived in Jamestown and, 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 got, and made a lot of money and made Jamestown a very prosperous city uh, growing tobacco. So the enforcement of the Navigation Act. So England was usually lax when enforcing regulations. So they would make these laws, but then they would kind of turn a blind eye, you know, if they weren't followed correctly. So it, it, it's, it's like a teacher talking really tough on the first day of school, 
But, you know, by, by the end of the week, you know, the kids are, are walking all over him or her, right? So, so it, it's kind of that attitude. It's called salutary neglect. And what that means is, so the American colonies were across the Atlantic Ocean, right? So it just made it harder for England to be able to exert any kind of real authority over them. Um, you'd have to really piss them off just to sort of make them, you know, get extra focused on you. England has some serious matters going on uh, in the mid 1600s to mid 1700s. One, you have the English Civil War, and then you have you got you got four wars with France going on. So you know they got a lot going on. They're they're, they're busy. Uh, as long as the Americans aren't really rebelling outright or whatever, then who cares if there's a little corruption, right? And there was, especially when it came to the the British officials who were in charge of, you know, the whole tariffs thing and, and getting things through the ports and all that. Um, merchants from the colonies realized that if we just place some, some smart bribes, you know, in the right place with the right people, then we can get past all these regulations from the Navigation Acts. So we also have something known as the Dominion of New England. Um, you have, once again... <laughs> King James II, he's kind of getting tired of, of all the smuggling that's happening. He he wants to sort of um, he wants to flex his muscles, right? He he wants to assert a lot more of his authority, and so by doing that, he starts to cancel representative assemblies going on, and he combined New York, New Jersey, and various parts of New England to create the colony, or I should say, it's more like the the uh, the crown colony, if you will, known as the Dominion of England. So if you look over here, okay, this all the red is what would become of the Dominion of England. So it's a pretty fair amount of, of land here. You got New York, you got Connecticut, you got Massachusetts, um, New Hampshire, New Jersey. I, it's, it's a fair amount of land going on here. And, and you know, of course, Rhode Island and, and all the other places, right? So you... Um, you have a new governor known as Sir Edmund Andros, uh, and he's widely unpopular. He's going to start increasing taxes, he's going to start limiting meetings, he's going to start revoking land titles. I mean, he's going to start. He's going to start becoming very um, an overseer over everything. He's going to be that that watchdog and the kind of freedom that the. American colonists had originally, it's going to start getting stripped away. So he's people aren't going to like him. But that's not just the colonists who are not going to like King James. The people in England himself didn't like King James II either. So King James II was overthrown in England, known as the Glorious Revolution. So you have this Glorious Revolution. That had, it's called Glorious Revolution because there wasn't any bloodshed, and yet you had you were able to do to, to uh, dethrone a king known as King James II and successfully put in William and Mary, William of Orange and Mary, uh, in, onto the throne. And one of the reasons uh, this happened was King James was, was more in favor of Catholicism and in England just they, they had become Protestant, you know, and, and embraced Protestantism and they didn't want to really identify. So after the Glorious Revolution, you have it where where uh, England says we will never be a, a Catholic nation again and, and, and basically puts it in, in, their, in writing that we are a Protestant nation and we'll always be. So this also puts an end to the glorious, or I'm sorry, to the domain of New England, the Glorious Revolution did. Colonists again start operating under separate charters. But keep in mind, regulation and trade uh, struggles between the colonists and England. This, is good. this isn't the first time, this isn't the last time it's going to happen. This is ultimately what's going to put the nail in the coffin, which will eventually lead to the Revolutionary War, will be these constant regulations in trading, um, tightening the noose, if you will, around these colonists when they're just so used to having the autonomy that they've enjoyed, and then all of a sudden... You know, after a war or so, England's going to start, you know, making them do more or pay more to pay for things. And it's going to cause problems. So go ahead and write your summary. And I look forward to talking about this with you when we return. Thanks. Bye.